Greetings, friends. In this video, I'll chiefly be drawing upon what I learned reading this book, The Giza Prophecy, The Orion Code, and the Secret Teachings of the Pyramids by Scott Creighton and Gary Osborne. And this came out in 2012, and it's a good book. It's a valuable book. Unfortunately, uh, kind of unclear as to so I'm not going to claim to be a scientific expert here. Uh, there's math, there's geometry, there's astronomy, there's a lot of diagrams, there's a lot of repetition. And sometimes the re it's, o it's okay to repeat things if you're making it more clear, but if you're just saying the same thing again, which is kind of obscure to a simpleton like me, uh, it doesn't get any more clear in the end. But I went over the book again in the last few days and I was kind of looking at the diagrams more closely. And I, uh, you know, precession isn't that complicated, but the earth wobbles on its axis. And um, so if you're a flat earther, don't read it about the ancient Egyptians, all, all the alternative stuff, because uh, they knew all about the planet uh, before uh, Western science even before there was really even a Western civilization. When there were glaciers on Europe, the ancient Egyptians were giving measurements of the planet. They were, but I'll get to that. Uh, so, you know, there's this idea that the pyramids are tombs. There's a lot of history in the book. So it's a good book. I just, I'm just saying, you know, could have been more smooth in its delivery. But basically, it's, it, it presents a lot of useful material. And uh, I would go with their theory which is that the, the pyramids were primarily, uh, it was a double function. They were astronomical clocks and they were recovery vaults in the event of a crisis, which, was, which they knew was very likely to occur because they were living in an unstable uh, time on the planet, geologically speaking, uh, close to the end of the last ice age. Or, or I mean, there's this idea, did, did things destabilize uh, r right at 10,000 years ago when the, the, the ice caps started to melt? Or was it still relatively stable until about uh, 3,980 BCE, before the Common Era, when there was a, some traumatic changes, which is marked by the location of the Sphinx, which is contained in a circle, which encircles the three pyramids, the three great pyramids at Giza, and then the two ones on each end, the small one and the big one, the Great Pyramid, they both have three Queen's Pyramids. So the functions of those pyramids, those three smaller Queen's Pyramids on each end are marking the culmination of the processional cycle. Uh, this is, I'm just, you know, Gary Osborne and Scott Creighton's theory, but they're showing it with the diagrams, they're showing it with the math, and, the, the, you know, it has to do with the Orion uh, Belt Star Constellation. That star constellation is, is, is mirrored at Giza. It's an actual mirror image. So it, it's not like they're produ reproducing that star belt, uh, which happens to be the three brightest stars in the sky. Everyone can still see Orion's belt very easily today, even if you live in a city. They're re reproducing it uh, so that south is up instead of north is up when we look on a map. For them, it's like the, the south star is on the upside and then the, the north star is on the, on the downside because it's a reversed image like as if you were looking in a mirror so it's very accurate and that and they have to do that for, for what they're trying to accomplish which is to provide a cycle of the processional cycle as the earth wobbles on its axis uh, roughly every 25 20, 26 thousand years I, i've heard longer maybe more than 30 thousand years maybe it's not always the same amount of time but so that would make a one half cycle about 13,000 years on the cycle. So the stars move around in the sky. They, they only by a degree, maybe a few degrees, but they do move. And noticeably, if you were keeping measurements over hundreds, over thousands of years, the stars would move in the sky and kind of uh, like they naturally move anyways. But then they would be moving kind of like the pole could shift on its axis. The, the North Pole may have even been in northern Greenland. The basic idea with this, what they call the star shafts is two star shafts are facing two stars, but specifically, well no, one star, al Natak. It's facing that star, but at two different angles. Two different angles. And these shafts were sealed up so that no one could even see them unless people would find them later and understand the picture which is being put forward here, which is that those Two angles 
are 6.5 degrees different because that's how much the earth would have shifted when it was when it was thrown off its axis so they're saying this is this is where Alnitok was in the sky and then that's where it was in the sky that's how much the earth got fucked up when something hit it or some or who knows what happened that's all it really was and they actually Creighton and Osborne actually say the star shaft angles pointing to Alnitok were determined the slope angles of the great pyramids that everything was built that was the core idea was because forget all the other stuff even about the culmination points if you can just focus on that star and, and show how that star was swung up and down by that much in relation to the ecliptic and, and the earth's axis then you have a, you know exactly what happened to the earth and then the other pyramids are telling you when they're telling you how to measure that they're serving as a calendar but but at least those star shafts are telling you the degree of movement in itself wouldn't tell you the calendar wouldn't tell you when but tell you how much it could tell you what could happen to the earth again in the future my goodness basically the pyramids were not tombs you can throw out the mainstream view that they were tombs because no mummified pharaoh was ever found in any pyramid not in at least any of the great ones and they did find uh, some bull bones because bulls were sacred uh, and um I mean, they've, they've found mummies, maybe one mummy in one of the, I don't know, there's other pyramids in Egypt too, so I don't know about those. But they, they, yeah, they may, some of them might have had a, a mummy or two, but not many. And you see, the, the issue here is intrusive bur burials. You got, I mean, even the mainstream historians, Egyptologists admit that the, the great pyramids uh, were, were in the oldest period of conventional Egyptian history, which the alternative historians would push back prob either much further into the past it's not not really known how much further but conventionally they date the great pyramids to around 2630 bce to about 2450 bce for those three big pyramids and the queen's pyramids all to be constructed at that site of course the sphinx is agreed to be older than that but that that's still quite old but but now the alternative historians have shown well uh there's char well of course carbon 14 dating isn't very good uh, it's notoriously unreliable but it, if you do take charcoal fragments which are evident on the great pyramids uh that evidence pushes the their date back to uh 400 to uh more than a thousand years older than is conventionally agreed that's still not all that much i mean okay so it's a, it's a little bit older even if you do rely on the c14 dating which is unreliable so there's really no way to concretely date it because you can't date stone stone is is, is just it was produced by the earth see there's no way what we really have of dating when it was cut these pyramids could have been older because there's about 123 missing kings from the official king lists because most of the king lists which are accepted by Egyptologists rely on Eusebius, Africanus, and Manethos or Manetho. I may be mispronouncing some of the names there. Manetho was a a priest living in the Ptolemaic period in the third, late third century before the Common Era. His writings are fragmented and edited. There's a big gap. There's a potential for 123 missing kings. Uh, Creighton and Osborne conclude this, this could add up to 2,000 years of missing history. Now that's not so crazy like, oh, the ancient Egypt goes back 50,000 years. I mean, maybe it could. But uh, if anything, that's, a, that's still pushing it. That's still significant. That's pushing it a lot further back, when, which is conventionally accepted. And uh, we know from Dr. Robert Schock and, and analyzing the, the rainwater erosion on the Sphinx, that the Sphinx is clearly much older. He said a conservative estimate would be 7,500 years old for the Sphinx. Uh, and then... Creighton and Osborne, they, they, this is a kind of fabulous. I wouldn't necessarily uh, give too much uh, weight to this, but it's interesting. They said that there were these geologists, and the names of the geologists were Vojislav I. Manichev and Alexander G. Parkomenko. I'm just quoting from the book there. They presented a paper to the International Conference of Geoarchaeology and Archaeominerology 
held in Sofia. I don't know where that is. Is that in Turkey or something? In October 2008, in this paper, they claimed that the Sphinx was submerged in seawater about 800,000 years ago, which caused wave cut hollows. This thing was under, under seawater. And you have to, the Sphinx is cut out of the bedrock. So that's not a natural formation that you could say, oh, it's, it would just be there naturally. It's like, no, that, that whole thing was, was ch chiseled or cut or excavated out of the bedrock. It's on a, a kind of a plateau now above the uh, city of Cairo. But actually the site of Giza sits uh, right at the top, at the apex of the Nile Delta. It actually encloses the entire Nile Delta within a 90 degree angle radiating out from what I believe is the Great Pyramid, uh, the, the biggest one. I could be wrong. One of those pyramids. And it, if you shoot radiate those two 90 degree angles outwards, it, it very neatly encloses the, the Nile Delta. Giza is also more or less at the center of the world's land masses, maybe not completely precisely. These pyramids were not tombs, as I mentioned, they didn't, we didn't found any uh, pier, uh, real mummies in them, and it's possible looters could have taken them, but surely there would be writing in the, because looters wouldn't take writing, they don't care about that, but there's been no writing, no hieroglyphs in any of the pyramids. Yes, they found a few bits of writing, some inscriptions. The name Khufu does appear. We know from the Valley of the Kings that these tombs would have been filled with writing. So it's very odd that these pharaohs who need these pyramids to ensure their afterlife are going to build a, a, a tomb without any writing. And then they're going to build it out in the open. This is the most mysterious thing. If, you, if they were built as a tomb, why would you build it out in the open where everyone could see it for miles around? It doesn't make any sense. It, it, it makes sense to build it if you wanted people to see it from far around. They were built as astronomical clocks and they were built as recovery vaults. This is the, their theory, but you know, holding seeds, weapons, uh, texts, talking about their history, their, all sorts of their scientific ideas and anything else you would really need, linens, oils, to uh, revivify a society following a collapse, following an agricultural collapse, climatic catastrophe. These pyramids were associated with Osiris. The whole site is linked to, of course, the, the Orion constellation, but also Osiris, the god or the lord of death. The lord of the dead is more precisely the way to put it. Lord of, lord of the dead and also of rebirth. He had green skin. He was partially mummified. He exists in the other world, on the other side. and But yet he's directly connected to this world. So the Egyptians were constantly thinking in spiritual terms. It's possible that later pharaohs in the dynastic period uh, appropriated the pyramids and used them as tombs. They may have used the sarcophagi. These very weighty sarcophagi in the king's chamber probably could have had the texts itself. It's unlikely that there would have been a mummy inside that. The Giza site was built as part of a unified plan. It was not built one pyramid after the other according to the needs and whims of each pharaoh over a long time. The biggest pyramid, the Pyramid of Khufu, is built not on the highest ground. It's built, why would you build on the highest ground if you wanted to? Because why do you want to be superseded? The middle pyramid is smaller, but because it's on higher ground, optically it often looks just as big or bigger than the Pyramid of Khufu. Why would he allow that to happen? There's also evidence that the causeway, uh, which is partly quarried away on either side to provide material for Khufu's pyramid, that causeway links up to the pyramid in the middle, the second pyramid, and that existed uh, for a long time, around the time it, uh, it, would, it would have already po po probably existed around the time of the building of Khufu's pyramid. Why would, he, why would he leave that causeway leading to the second somewhere else that's not leading even to his pyramid? Why would he like, why would he like that? That's, I mean, unless it wasn't his tomb at all and this was part of a unified plan to mirror the Orion constellation in a way that they could track the movements of those stars 
Al Nitak mirrored the movement of that constellation uh, within a line that you draw uh, connecting the pyramids. And again, I'm not so great on this. I'm not a math person here, astronomy person, but it's fascinating stuff. But that this laner line, they call it, tracks the processional cycle. And with the, like I said, the, the two sets of Queen's pyramids only at one end or the other, maximum cycle, maximum culmination or minimum culmination. They're, the one in the middle doesn't have any pyramids. The pyramid of Rachaf, that's what I should have called it, right? Or as it's so called, who knows who really built it. Yeah, it may have actually been Rachaf. But he, he's supposed to have had uh, numerous queens, and yet he didn't build any pyramids for his queens. So, yeah, throw out this idea that the pyramids are tombs. They were probably never originally tombs. They, they may have been used later. The stuff about the rituals in dynastic Egypt later on, that may have happened where the, they do rituals in the pyramids and the pharaoh goes into the central chamber and... Uh, you know, almost in a psychedelic experience, his consciousness rises into the sky to uh, do battle or receive wisdom or whatever. And I mean, that's really interesting. That may have gone on later on, but I don't know if that was the according to Osborne and Creighton. But I never, I didn't believe that anyways. I was just looking to read more on the subject, and now I have more reasons not to believe that they were tombs. Because it just doesn't add up. It doesn't make any sense. You have tombs in the Valley of the Kings. You have all sorts of other tombs. I'd lo love to go to Egypt. I've been to Peru and seen some ancient stuff. By the way, the ancient architecture in Peru, there are some similarities with this mysterious ancient Egyptian architecture. You look at the trapezoidal openings for a lot of these doorways. You look at a lot of some of the, this big megalithic architecture. There are certain, not only that, that it's megalithic architecture from an unknown ancient period, but also, you know, some of the specific forms which are being used in the architecture are eerily similar. Osiris was supposed to mythically have been, you know, murdered and, and divided into 14 pieces. And there's 13 uh, ancient structures at Giza, uh, which are, and the site was associated with Osiris. So the fact that there's 13 makes you think, well, where's the, if, if Osiris was divided into 14 pieces, where's the 14th piece? So there's this mystery that there's another, there could be another uh, structure which is hidden and that the very math, the very angles of the site may be pointing to this area. And in fact, this area today is walled off, is fenced off, and the Egyptian authorities won't allow any investigation there. The Egyptian authorities uh, do this throughout Egypt. They, they chain stuff off. Meanwhile, they allow... Uh, other sites to go into neglect and, and turn into refuse dumps and then some of the sites which could still be unexplored and offer some real evidence they don't let you uh, explore that at all but i'm not i mean people say there's 14 structures at giza but one of them was not a was a dynastic structure wasn't one of the ancient ones so, so i don't know who knows maybe that, that's just one way they're looking at it According to Osborne and Creighton, the overall dimensions of the Great Pyramid contain measurements from which Earth's size and shape can be derived. Now I'm going to read a quote from their book, quote, uh, The Great Pyramid in an east-west cross-section contains within its angle geometry a geophysical map of Earth with its own location in relation its own location is the key by which all this geophysical information can be understood. When superimposed over a 360 degree circle representing the circumference of Earth and with the king's chamber aligned with the center of this circle, the cross section can be used as a gauge marker for showing where the Great Pyramid would be with respect to the equator and the ecliptic. The ecliptic is a straight line. It's an imaginary line, but it runs from the Earth through the sun to the other side, to the zodiac constellation on the other side. And you can imagine that line staying straight, connected to the earth, through the sun to the other side, uh, rotate as the earth rotates around the sun in 365 earth days. If the earth were uh, not tilted at t about 23.5 degrees obliquity to the the ecliptic, then we would have no seasons because then the earth would be rotating perfect 
uh, to the sun. There wouldn't be any real tilt. So it would just be like a tropical world. Uh, maybe that would be good or bad. I don't know. But there wouldn't really be any seasons. It would just be altitude and proximity to oceans, which would dictate weather. Uh, so that's interesting. But th th I mean, there's some myth myths that the Earth was once like that. And you got to wonder, I mean, why is the Earth tilted? It must it could have been very well hit by something that did that. And so there, there's this reference, which I, when I originally referenced this book, it was because the, the Masons and uh, uh, other, other people, you know, in the occult and just in, in re even religious painters for the church for centuries following the collapse of the Roman Empire, they incorporated the angle of 23.5 degrees in some of its variant angles. They would incorporate that in different parts of their images, often in images associated with death and destruction. Famine, war, starvation, to signify that there's some deep connection, some vulnerability of the earth uh, with regards to its axis. And the Egyptians are saying, here's the processional cycle. Here's the midpoint. Here's a circle around our site. Watch this clock. Now that we got your attention, and you see they put the sphinx in the mid-cycle. So when, when, when the star culmination is getting close to the mid-cycle, you know you're in a, a zone of danger. That's You could be getting close to get, being hit by asteroids. And the, the Sphinx is the Lord of Terror, because if you're getting close to that time, you know, oh boy, we got to watch out here. Creighton and Osborne, they referred to this mathematician who put all this stuff into a computer model. And yes, the Earth can be thrown off of its axis uh, if it gets hit by an asteroid, it, it's not so likely to happen, but it could happen at the right if it happens at the right time in the right place, and then, then it can be thrown off its axis. But it will probably go back to its uh, previous axis. But it could take a long time for that to happen. It could take hundreds of years, or maybe more than a thousand years. What about the, you know? I, I said a bit before about the recovery vaults. Could they really have been recovery vaults? I mean, part of me is a little skeptical because really, I mean. That's where you chose to build recovery vaults. I mean, uh, I mean, an astronomical clock. No one's going to destroy that. But what if the wrong people find your recovery vault? And especially if you're leaving weapons there. The recovery vault was the least explored idea in the in the book. Maybe because there's just more stuff to say ab about astronomy and the angles and the geometry. Um, but yeah, there is evidence of seeds. Apparently, some evidence in some of the pyramids. And I. But the other stuff, you know, all that stuff is, is hypothetical because it would have been taken out long ago. But they do, interestingly, they have one chapter where they go more into depth than this. And they're pointing out that the Grand Gallery in the, in the, great, the great Pyramid, where the ceiling gets really big. I've never been there. I've never been to Egypt because uh, it just seems like a dangerous, stressful place to visit. Maybe it's not that dangerous, but I've heard people say that it's just, there's so much pressure on you as a tourist from all the hawkers and all the guides and they're just just gonna put you in a cattle car and just herd you along and it's just like kills the the joy of the experience it just sounds like a stressful place approaching the king's chamber going through the grand gallery that's a big space but so finely made just for what where are the shelving units i don't get it and, but apparently they sealed it with boulders in between, like big plugs. And that would make sense if you're trying to uh, kill the airflow. Because seeds can last a long time if they, don't, if they don't have any moisture affecting them. And then, of course, there's lots of uh, underground chambers. So yeah, I guess there is a lot of space, potential storage space at Giza. But geez, they sure built huge structures just, just to do a fairly simple thing like that. But maybe that's because it was just a side function to the being an astronomical clock. What if there was a flood and then it flooded everything underground? Then you would just have some, yeah, you would have some chambers above. Even with alternative historians that might not agree with uh, Creighton and Osborne, they would probably agree that whoever built these things, it was an unstable period in uh, history, in, you know, in terms of the physical stability of the planet and its ecosystems. And the ancients probably knew that. And that, had, that did have something to do with the construction of the pyramids. So what are the implications for our understanding of history if Creighton and Osborne are on the right track here? And other people like Graham Hancock, Robert Boval, 
John Anthony West, a, f- a few other people I'm probably leaving out, Robert Schock and other people who've really uh, looked into this, if, if they're on the right track, then as Hancock says, we are a species with amnesia. We just, we think that we're at the, the culmination and that we're at, we're at the, the height of progress. No, we're, I mean, come on, even if the mainstream people are right, and I don't even necessarily believe in evolution, not in all the, it says different things. I don't believe all of them. But even if you take their picture that we're 195,000 years old, uh, roughly speaking, anatomically speaking. Uh, That's still a heck of a lot of time. You think we were all just hunter-gatherers for all that time when we just figured out the Industrial Revolution, uh, you know, or the Scientific Revolution a few hundred years ago? It's not very likely that, I mean, uh, there have been all sorts of cataclysms in between that have wiped out our memory. And if the ancient Greeks, if Plato believed that a true knowledge is just a form of remembering what you already knew, or perhaps um, figuratively what your, what your uh, civilizational ancestors, what they knew, then that, it makes sense in this sort of cataclysmic uh, perspective. And also a uh, fantastic to believe that what was going on in ancient Egypt? How, fa- how advanced were they? This is pretty advanced. It's, it's on the level of what our civilization could do, but I don't think there's the sort of the coherence in our civilization today to want to do something for what here seems to be a noble purpose. And this is one of the perplexing uh, themes when it comes to the pyramids, when it comes to contemplating other th- mis- mysteries of creation. It, are these architects good or bad? Because the mainstream view has them as very bad because they were, uh, they had, the pharaohs had huge egos and they were using slaves to construct these things, even though it's not very likely that slaves could get it done rolling logs. I don't, I don't believe it. I think it would, I think they needed power tools, to be honest. Uh, there's actually evidence for that pointed out by Christopher Dunn, pointed out by other people. Um, I'll try to find some pictures of, of that because, yeah, there, there, there are certain, I mean, maybe not all the granite blocks themselves. Sure, maybe those could be quarried and moved, you know, but there's, but I mean, all, there are lots of artifacts, not just at Giza, but around in the, the, the temple and, you know, things that are so well cut, so smoothly cut through stone so hard that it might even have required power drills. Uh, many times harder what even exists today. How fabulous or what did they really understand back then? Well, we can we can look at the astronomy. At least we have that. But it'll always be a mystery to us. Well, there's the Baghdad battery. There's there's other artifacts where they they talk about the you know ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, carvings depicting something which looks like a light bulb, something which looks like electricity. So those star shafts. They found something that looked like an electrical plug inside it. With it was kind of like, it looked like maybe uh, deteriorated a bit. But yeah, there was two things. It looked like an electrical plug, it sort of so ways up this shaft that the robot found because they put in a robot which went up this shaft. It's a very small shaft. Maybe a squirrel could fit in there. These shafts were just sort of sealed off inside. So the implications are that the ancients could have been just as advanced or or more advanced than how we are today. And that's not even getting into other wacky theories about Atlantis and Vimanas and colonies on the moon and wow that's a rabbit hole but we don't have time to get into that just here but I will close by talking about some of the more fabulous theories uh, Graham Hancock I w- you know he's I wouldn't say he's more far out I mean he's done a good job presenting lots of evidence but he put forward this kind of I wouldn't say it's a crazy idea but it's certainly a fabulous idea that the pier- that Yes, they knew that the earth was unstable and they were actually building the pyramids to stabilize the northern hemisphere from earthquakes. But maybe that's not true. But I don't even think he necessarily, uh, you know, would would have to agree with that. But he was putting forward that idea. It was kind of interesting. I mean, that would involve science that I don't can't even begin to get into. But. Um, and then, you know, there's always these mediums, there's these, uh, I, well, I guess that's the same thing as a psychic, more or less, but, or they go into trance, and then, so of course you can't, you can only take it with a grain of salt, I mean, but uh, it's always interesting to hear what they have to say, and I, I was listening to one channel, I don't even remember what it was, but, and, uh, so who knows if you can trust these people, but they're, they're, they're employing uh, mediums to look at stuff like Atlantis, look at, look at ancient Egypt, and, and there was this one, 
Buddhist's perspective that the, the pyramids were built for bad. So is it for good? Is it for bad? Here it was like, no, it was, it, they were bad and they were extraterrestrials. They were enslaving humankind. But there were two types of humans. There were regular humans like us. And then there was like a sub subspecies of clones which were used in the quarries. Uh, cutting these rocks with like highly advanced laser cutters. And then the stones were... Uh, actually assembled by the regular humans, but they used levitation devices that the, the stones were actually levitated and floated from their source and into a... Uh, I've also heard weird stuff like the pyramids were built from the top down, but who knows how that would happen. Uh, maybe with levitation, I don't know. But So I don't, I'm not saying I believe that. The other problem with mediums, is I believe mediums can get in... I, there's entities, there's all sorts of things and ways of uh, you know, tapping into the universal consciousness or whatever to get information. But there's also demons. A lot of entities aren't honest. And, and a demon will lie. It will tell you all sorts of crazy stuff just to confuse you. Just like we've been confused uh, with all these wacky theories uh, uh, distracting us from the truth, disinformation, sending us off on the wrong course. That's That's been going on and it's still going on. So I'm not saying I necessarily believe that the pyramids were built by evil extraterrestrial aliens. It's an interesting idea to think that aliens could have been involved. I do believe in aliens. I just don't know when, when and where they come to the planet. The machine tools thing, that has more weight. Definitely, uh, that's something you can actually look at some real evidence that real engineers People who are experienced using power tools, they look at this thing and say, well, how else could you build it without power, power tools? Unless there's some other science more advanced that we don't know. Either way, you're, pr you're proving that they were at least as advanced as we are. So were the pyramids built for good or for bad? I mean, I, I mean, even if they were built by these ETs, to do what? I mean, to just to, to glow, to create a glow? Oh, right, the, the power plant idea. I can't, I can't, uh, that's of course, I, I can't conclude without giving a brief mention to the power plant idea. That's more fabulous, but again, it it's interesting. I don't know if I fully believe it, but they made a story there. Many authors have because, the, you know, the pyramids built over an, over the water table close to the Nile. It would have been closer to the Nile in the past. And so that, that water table rising and falling seasonally uh, underneath the pyramids, there's, uh, there's cavities which would fill with water, which rise and fall, and then that would create a natural charge and then the pyramid would be channeling that through the underground cavities which were just sort of roughly hewn out of the rock almost like it was tuning an instrument because it's not precise and streamlined and f smoothly polished and finished like the rest of the pyramid on the inside the underground cavities are cavernous hancock was saying well it lo looks like they just stopped at one point they're like okay we got enough space here now the tuning is right. So as if the pyramid was a musical note, it was all vibrating to one note. I do believe there is a note it vibrates to. I don't know what it is. And that so they achieved just the right balance. So that's good. I don't know. Maybe that's different from the power plant. idea. The power plant idea is that they use granite. Granite is a living stone. It has quartz in it. Quartz is a crystal in the stone which can conduct electricity. Granite is also extremely hard and slightly radioactive. And then it would have been cased in limestone. We can see a little bit of the limestone on the Great Pyramid still left at the top. That was all uh, van not vandal. It was it was you know it was taken. It was stolen later to be used in construction, probably by the Arabs who came. Because you know the ancient Egyptians were not the Arabs who are now occupying Egypt. The the Arabs who now occupy Egypt were the result of a more recent historical development. Um, so, so the power plant idea is interesting and we don't know what's at the top of the Great Pyramid that's, that's missing. That's missing. It was something metallic there, something conducting all that, that energy from generated by the rising and falling of the water through the pyramid up to the top by the use of this granite partially radioactive living stone encased with the limestone as a giant battery channeling it to the top then you have an internet signal then you have unlimited electricity well, maybe that's a little fabulous i don't know if that was really the case do you but because why would you build a power plant that even for if it was ancient ets with highly advanced technology even for them it would be a, a considerable job to pile all the stone here Right, just to build a power plant. If you have that sort of, if you have levitation technology, why do you have to build a giant mountain of stone to generate electricity? I'm not denying that the, the the pyramids could have generated electricity. They may very well have generated electricity, 
and glowed, but that probably wasn't their primary purpose. Uh, like John Anthony West said, he, they may have glowed, but they're primarily, like he took the positive view that it was built. They were sort of like a positive vibe around the pyramids and they gave reassurance to people. Again, getting into that theme of instability, the people knew the world was unstable. They knew that something was going to happen and, and it might not last forever. That everything they knew would come crashing down. And for a time, the pyramids comforted people and stabilized their, I don't know, their psychic, uh, social, mental psyche. I don't know. I don't know. It's interesting. So there you have it. I'm not going to go off too long here. And I've been going in all these different directions because the pyramids in ancient Egypt, it's like, it's like interlinked matrix here, all these things in Peru, this space, all these connections. How do, how do you possibly pick one point to start and one point to finish? You, every point opens up to different points. That's the problem when you're really interested in knowledge, is it can go on forever in a million different directions, a million different rabbit holes. Hasta luego, amigos! <laughs>